Okay, so this is third and probably, unless we uncover some other line that we want to get into more, this is the third and final part of our discussion on um, Rebel Wisdom's analysis of Joe Rogan's interviews with um, Peter McCulloch and um, Robert Malone with Zubin Demania. So um, rather than sort of look at specific bits of the video and critique those as we've sort of done in the first couple of parts, this is a more sort of general thing. Um, it, it occurs to me that rebel wisdom have not really entered the fray that much around COVID, right? And and have only stepped in a couple of times, once around ivermectin, and once more around Joe Rogan and um, and Peter McCulloch and Robert Malone. And their motivation for doing so, I uh, see if you agree with this, Josh, would be something along the lines of wanting to make sure that the antithesis position does not betray itself by going off the rails right and so his critique is actually an attempt to strengthen the antithesis position and the whole method methodology by which the alternative media functions in order to you know make its credibility more robust would you agree something like that yeah that's what well i said i think the one um i i would say that they've I mean, they they haven't entered the fray around COVID. Um, it certainly haven't, you know, made it a primary focus over a long period of time. But they got very deep into kind of the weeds. You know, they were interviewing Yuri Dagan and um, you know the Drastic Collective and and um, a whole bunch of other um, people around these these questions um, related to kind of the dark horse. And all through, my sense was always that um, just trying to uh, help the antithesis points um be be as clean as possible yeah the, the antithesis position where it's valid you know um shore that up but also point out where um it's it's going wrong or, or people are making claims that are overstated or just you know false um but some people it seems like within rebel wisdom um just kind of their taste buds or whatever get it's like why why aren't they why are they focusing on flaws on the antithesis side when the thesis side is, you know, has all these flaws. Um, and it seems like within the sort of rebel wisdom community, it's like, that's already obvious. Like we're, you know, we, it's easy to see the, the problems with the sort of legacy media um, uh, sense making. And so the useful thing it feels like for rebel wisdom is, you know, making sure that the, just trying to keep things sane and uh, yeah, do like sanity checks on, antithesis where it, it goes overboard so it seems like we're more on the same page now than maybe when we were talking well, about I, I think on that level yeah i think where we probably differ is i feel like and i still feel because i watched it again like in the intervening time between doing this and the and the last videos we did I've, I've watched it again and i continue to have the feeling that it comes across as a little bit of a hit piece right like a soft hit piece kind of thing and and that its primary purpose is to uh, focus on what is wrong with the anti with the antithesis position, right? Rather than amplifying the many valid points that are made, it, it seems to be nitpicking at, you know, looking for things that are wrong in order to amplify those. Is what it, it, it is what it continues to feel like to me. Um, and so, mm -hmm. while I accept the broader point of critique is important in the overall process of making the position stronger, I completely accept that. And I also completely accept rebel, rebel wisdom or have a legitimate role to play in that process. I, I absolutely, but what I said in the last video, I, I still kind of continue to feel that, that the focus is always on the relatively few things that these people say, which are, you know, say off the rails, right? And I wouldn't even necessarily disagree that they are, but let's just say for the sake of argument, you know, the relatively few things they say which are off the rails compared to the very large volume of things they say, which are certainly worthy at least of, con of further consideration. So I think that's probably where we differ. And uh, we discussed before we came on camera, uh, but I, I feel that this, it's the notion of harm, right? I mean, David mentioned this lots of times, both in the Ivermectin videos and in these videos that, um, He's concerned about the harm that this misinformation could cause if it was taken on board as true. What I think would be interesting to do would be to A, try and identify what is the harm that Brett Weinstein, for example, or Robert Malone or Peter McCulloch, that the supposed misinformation that they are putting out, what is the harm that that could cause? And what, how does that compare to 
the harm that can be caused by the more extreme aspects of the thesis position, right? For example, the unnecessary risk of vaccinating the already infected or people who have almost zero risk of getting seriously ill from it. You know, for, for example, I mean, there are other things as well. So, you know, uh, 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 masks, right? Uh, the children not being able to see facial expressions, you know, like all of, all of these <clears> kinds <throat> of things, you know, these harms don't get talked about very much. And yet the harms of Sorry, I've talked for a long time. I will shut up and let you respond in a second. You know, the, the harms of some small number of people don't get vaccinated and take ivermectin instead, right? The, the, how do these things actually balance up against each other? Yeah, um, some things are still, um, I, I think a number of things will be more clear as time passes and more, you know, research is done, more, more uh, fewer, um, made on the available data. Um, even just recently, I was hearing a story about how um, CDC hadn't been releasing, they've been releasing uh, proclamations uh, about, yeah, basically public health policy, but not releasing the data that was based on, that those were based on. And now that they are releasing it, it's like, you know, that should have been done all along, right? So that smart people, you know, with different, backgrounds could look at it and poke it apart and rather than kind of it, it's almost like um kind of starting with the like the behavior that you want from the population and, and reverse engineering the results <laughs> from the data instead um so yeah I, I think a number of these things you know like ivermectin versus uh and you know different age ranges and all the different ways to slice the data it'll be more clear as time passes but my general sense um with regard to like why why point out the flaws or the incorrect statements in um, antithesis actors or um, representatives like Malone, McCullough, um, Van der Bosch, et cetera. And I think there's a couple there's a couple ways. One, one is like the potential for a slippery slope. Um, so it's not even just like what they're saying in the in the interview, but what like if people kind of decide like, oh, this is this is the truth. I'm gonna, you know, listen a lot to this guy. And they they go find, you know, say for Malone, for example, he kind of toned it down for the Rogan interview. But if they go watch some of those other things where he's really hammering home the uh um the risk to yeah, the risk to children and like it's irrevocable and, and all this all this stuff. Um it it can it can go kind of down some rabbit holes that are uh you know even more extreme and so people can get kind of lost and they they can lose um touch with sort of the balance like there's there are things wrong with the thesis position um and there are important things to pay attention to with what some of the antithesis folks are saying um but it's important to kind of keep a keep a, a balance and not go all in on you know one or the other so, so th there's a slippery slope aspect, and then there's um, even just focusing on specifically what they said. If, um, and again, like I mentioned last time, I'm not, I, I think um, the benefits of vaccines uh, have been overblown, overstated, right? It, obviously the results, you know, break through infections and, and all these kinds of things. Um, a lot of the promises or the, the notions as they were rolled out, it turned out to not be true. Um, but even with that, um, it, it does, the data does seem to bear out the effectiveness within, you know, certain populations, um, not, not the younger, but, um, definitely older and maybe some, some middle with, uh, comorbidities being, um, benefiting from having a vaccine as far as not being hospitalized or dying. So to the extent that, you know, people in those cohorts, would pay attention to say Malone or McCullough and you know decide against vaccination there could be harm uh, there again assuming that you know the efficacy of vaccines and preventing hospitalization and death in those in those groups um, which again I think will get more accurate um, you know details around all, all of that as, as more time passes but that's sort of my current understanding. No, and the, the, the slippery slope argument is, is an often used one and, and, it, is, and it is very often applicable. Um, 
but but again, but I, I come back to the lack of contrast with the same slippery slope argument. Why is that not being applied to the thesis position, right? Because I mean, as 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 you have just said, what the CDC did, as I as I understand it, I mean, I haven't gone deep into this story, but I am familiar with it, is that they omitted the eighteen to forty nine data, right, from from their from their statistics. And so when they say that the boosters are whatever percent effective for the under sixty fives. What they're actually talking about is the 50 to 65 year old bracket, right? The entire 18 to 49 has been left out of the data set. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it is, a, it is a blatant manipulation of the data because in the 18 to 49, there is little or no difference. You know, there, there, is, there, is little, there, is, there is little or no benefit because they're at such low risk anyway, unless they have comorbidities. The other thing I would say is that, and I'm not certain of this, but, it, but, I, but I have a strong intuition that this is the case, that the vast majority of people who are unvaccinated are not in the high risk groups, right? Like most people who are who have chosen not to be vaccinated have chosen not to be vaccinated because they feel themselves to be at very low risk. And why should I get vaccinated and assume an unknown, ri unknown risk when I believe I already have a very low level of risk, right? Like either I've already had it or I'm young and healthy or whatever, right? So I, I, I get the sense that the whatever it is, 20, 25 percent of populations who are resistant to getting vaccinated very few of those are are high risk people yeah that's i guess that's my sense too i um yeah i'd, I'd be interested to see um more statistics on it but um in general that's yeah um that's my sense so yeah with regard to potential harm then maybe that's you know the, the any vaccine hesitancy, you know, maybe, maybe the Malone Mattel, um opinions wouldn't move the needle in in groups that, yeah, for, for whom the vaccine wouldn't wouldn't be as um, uh, effective or, yeah, meaningful or needed, or yeah, uh, I don't think it's ever necessarily needed, right? It's just um, it's a question of cost benefit, and if you know, for for more vulnerable older comorbid um, populations um, there does seem to be consistent you know that it, that yeah. it is beneficial but um, yeah the uh, you know obviously the natural immunity is also very effective but the the, the whole thesis thing has been to push the vaccine that's very you know just sort of like one better, right now you've got super immunity <laughs> yeah yeah and it's yeah that was just ludicrous so yeah, no, but this is, I think that that's, that's actually, you stumbled across a really good example here, right? And so the thesis is saying, well, if you've had it before, you should still get vaccinated because this will give you super immunity. Whereas the antithesis would say, well, if I've already had it, why should I get vaccinated? I'm assuming an unknown risk. Anyone taking these vaccines is assuming some level of unknowable risk, right? And it may be, it may be nothing or it may be something huge. We, 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 we have no way to know that at the moment. So yeah, the that's the difference, right? So in, in this particular case, the thesis is saying reduce your risk even further by taking the vaccine. And the antithesis would be saying unnecessarily increasing your risk by taking the vaccine. Right. Yeah. This is kind of the question, right? Which of these positions is potentially more harmful? Yeah, it could be. It could be a question. Um... Yeah, I guess you could, we could also, I mean, it could also be explored in terms of, um, his thesis is in a sense dominant, or at least it has the historical, you know, it has the um, the infrastructure, you know, the institutions, the, the, the broadcast um, uh, capability, but it's also, it seems like becoming increasingly, it's kind of like the emperor has no clothes thing is, is more possible now that it was say you know some decades ago because of the the internet and the possibility for people to sense make you know uh, uh, outside of these legacy institutions mm. um but they've doubled down on you know the, the sort of old school um yeah broadcast like we're, we're gonna actually sort of keep some of the information in our back pocket not share it and just share what is beneficial for what we think um people should do um, so, you know, risk with the vaccine being minimized, downplayed or excluded. Um, and so that's why it's it's useful and important to have voices, you know, especially voices with authority 
uh, and experience in the field like these doctors to point out, you know, there are risks that aren't being talked about. Um, and then that's like the wheat, right? The, the wheat from the chaff thing. Um, it's just, we, we also, you know, I, for good sense making, don't want to go too far overboard with, with some of those claims, um, whether it's, you know, the effectiveness of ivermectin, it's like, you know, some people getting almost religious about it, you know, only paying attention, like whatever it was at the time, I think the Uttar Pradesh uh, study in India, some people were interpreting it as this means that it's, you know, almost 100% effective against COVID, but there's all, um, there's a bunch of factors as far as like COVID had already gone through that population to a large extent. So they, um, there was, and there wasn't good data collection on that. So there was a lot of natural immunity already. Um, the, the extent to which the ivermectin had been, uh, uh, disseminated to people wasn't it wasn't actually all that clear so anyway there were just all these um, and it was only one part of a pa complex package of things right it wasn't like right. just ivermectin it was a it was a it was a yeah it was a package of i can't remember like a dozen different things right right so it's just like some people latched on to that and just kind of ran with this this narrative that it's super effective and it's like so that's that's a weakness on the antithesis side where they're overstating it. Um, on the thesis side, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> you know the yeah, like yeah, Saturday yeah, night the horse thing, blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah horse yeah, dewormer, absolutely, you know. Absolutely. But I mean, something yeah. seems to have been left out. But by rebel wisdom, also right, is that even if ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are not nearly as effective as they make out but a they're unlikely to have zero effectiveness right there'd be some effectiveness in some cases right um and very little possibility for harm right it's exactly it's like, it's this is exactly my point very very little possibility for harm if administered correctly right you know, there, there's almost no possibility for harm and so it's the kind of thing in an emergency where you don't really know and you're throwing the kitchen sink at everything why not you know what i mean and why restrict its use when there is almost no harm likely to be incurred by its use and if yep. nothing else even if it's not effective against covid it may very well be effective against co-infections which given you've got covid could now be a threat you know what i mean like there's, there's so there's <laughs> you know the, 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 anyway so yeah the the i i think i don't know whether there's the mainstream media or what exactly but i i, I think the rebel was the, sorry not the rebel the ivermectin argument got distorted into it's a miracle drug or it's useless right and 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 the, the middle ground stuff kind of seems to have been largely forgotten and the and and it's not doing anyone any harm and if so doctors think it's going to help their patients they should be able to give it to them right like that that seems to me to be an unassailable basic simple truth yeah um, yeah it's uh, like a lot of this, it's really unfortunate how um, polarized things got and, and even politicized. I think it started, um, it, a lot of it started with Trump being sort of, you know, touting hydroxychloroquine. And then, of course, you know, with <laughs> on the on the left, like uh, Trump derangement syndrome, anything he, he says is good, we're going to think is bad, basically. Um, and then that carried through to like ivermectin and other, um, yeah, sort of like pre-existing antivirals or whatever. Um so that that's been a factor but uh yeah and i don't i mean the hope would be like i think we talked about before that um in a future instance the u.s would would approach things more like japan did where you know they it, it's more honesty um you know transparency like here's what we know here's what we recommend not you know just sort of like hammering um for for one sort of remedy um, and, and, you know, going overboard with lockdowns, not considering the, the, um, that's another big thing. I think that, um, will, I, I think it's now in the conversation a bit more sort of in retrospect, but like going into it, 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 there was really no consideration. It seemed of the, uh, you know, the economic impact, like people not being able to well, work. There was, and, there was, it just didn't get airtime. There were plenty of people talking about mm -hmm. it. Unheard were doing interviews with people very early on about exactly this kind of thing. The Great I guess in the main Declaration was about exactly this. Um, but, you know, it just, it didn't get any traction at the time. Yeah, now, now it's too fucking late. Now it's getting talked about. <laughs> yeah, a lot of damage done. <clears throat> yeah, really. But, really. you know, it's like... Can, it, you know, are, are we going to learn from the lessons? Um, uh, you know, 
given the track record in the U.S. and the, the level of polarization, um, it yeah, I'm not I'm not hugely optimistic, but um, I, I always try to hold out you know some optimism. Like there's a lot of unprecedented things that have been happening over the last you know two three years, and um, so yeah, maybe maybe we'll we'll see some trends in better directions there in the U.S. But um, yeah, internationally, um, and I guess that's another. We are like it's it's we're we're so global now. Um, it's it, we still can you know there's still sort of like pockets of uh, propaganda in different places, but for the most part we can kind of get a general sense of what's what other countries are doing, what the effects are, um, and so it's it seems like it's it should be politically harder for one country to to still be all in on say lockdowns mandates when when you know countries like britain and a bunch of other places are being more reasonable um but we'll see <laughs> I, I i i do want to stay around this notion of harm and um but just one other thing on ivermectin before i before i jump back to harm was that the other argument that was never really brought into the discussion sufficiently in my opinion was that it was the idea that if hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or anything else for that matter, you know, existing repurposed drugs were found to be effective treatments for COVID, that would have undermined the issuance of the EUA. I mean, it's open to legal interpretation as to exactly how it's worded, but existing effective treatments means that emergency use authorization is likely not to have been granted to the vaccine. So there, there, there is the potential, not saying there was, but there is certainly the potential, the incentive structure certainly existed for the pharmaceutical companies to actively suppress the benefits of these things because it could undermine the vaccination program. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think on the previous one that we looked at, um, Zubin was, he had a couple arguments against that, like examples of other existing um, medic one, one which was actually um, put out, I don't remember the name of it. Um, and then anyway, there, there's there's some nuance in, in that. Um, but in general, I, I, it does seem, I mean, it's pretty clear how enmeshed like the pharmaceutical mm. uh, industry is with government. They, they had a, really a lot of influence over the, um, uh, Obamacare, you know, when the when the ACA was being developed, they got a whole bunch of concessions there. Um, they, you know, they're uh, they're also enmeshed with the you know the, the Blue Church broadcast media. They're you know advertised there, and their their CEOs come on, you know, given free airtime to yeah, yeah. Um, talk about things. So it's um, yeah that 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 narrative or that um, way of seeing things makes sense to me, and I think it. It probably was a factor. Um, besides the, the, you know, the political polarization thing, you know, the, the Trump derangement thing. Um, there's also, it, yeah, they might not have had to nudge too much, but they would have. They would have been nudging to try to discredit something um, other than vaccines. I mean, it would have been in their their interest, so it wouldn't surprise me. So yeah, going back to the harm thing, I've sort of got uh, I've got a list of three or four harms that i think the thesis position has caused and my contention is that they dwarf so before i get into those let me just ask you is it beyond the idea that you know if people were to listen to malone vandenbosch weinstein whatever that they wouldn't take the vaccine that they otherwise would have taken right like that that was that was the deciding factor that got them to take it that wouldn't and instead they choose to take ivermectin as a prophylactic or whatever right beyond that is there is there, is there harm that i'm missing beyond that well let's you know obviously stick to statements that were made not ones that could have been made because uh yeah well, even hypothetically enough, but... i don't mind i don't mind even hypothetically mm -hmm. like what 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 is the what is the potential harm that could be caused by misinformation on the antithesis side this is this is kind of the question i'm asking beyond people not getting vaccinated that otherwise would what what harms are there 
Yeah. Well, the, I suppose taking wrong doses of hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin because they can't get it prescribed and they get it through some dodgy source and end up taking wrong doses. Like I, that's also, I guess, a possible harm. Right. Yeah. And um, despite the over the over played uh, horse dewormer thing, like some people actually were getting that mm -hmm. version of it because that, that was all that was available. But obviously, you know, it, it's been used with humans for, for well, a very long time. That harm is actually caused by the thesis side, not allowing people to get their doctors to prescribe it for them. Right. Or, or at least contribute yeah. to that harm. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, again, the ideal thing would be, you know, throw throw every possible remedy you know and collect data on the results and over time you know you get a, a sense of the you know the, the mix of things that's a good sort of regimen um rather than just dismissing it um isn't that exactly what pierre so, corey did though and 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 peter mccullough i mean isn't exactly isn't that exactly what they've been doing is chucking everything at everyone and making observations and deducing what seems to work and what doesn't i mean is that not essentially exactly what they've been trying to do um I mean, they've they've been more open to yeah. I mean, obviously, and yeah, they're pointing out there there are these things that are potentially effective. There's some evidence that they're effective, and they're they're being the overboard thing is like they're being suppressed, um, you know. And there's this big conspiracy theory, and the, you know, the hospitalists are in on it, right? Like, mm. you know, how much harm, like potentially, um, people not trusting doctors when they when they go in. There could be some harm there. No, um, no, fair enough. Actually, Zubin did did mention that 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 you know patients are going in dubious of their doctor's advice because of things. And and I think that I think that is I think that is a real I think that is a real thing. But I also think I'm sorry if I cut you off there. I do apologise. But I also think Zubin mischaracterised this hospitalist's comment that I think it was Robert Malone. I can't remember which of them was made. I think he's mischaracterised it slightly because I don't think. When it was said they were actually blaming the individual doctors what they were blaming were the incentive structures that exist in the healthcare service right and apparently mm -hmm. according to peter mcculloch there are up to thirty thousand dollars of incentives for a hospital to declare a patient a covid patient positive to get them on a ventilator and for them to die of covid in the hospital right there is a total of thirty thousand dollars of payouts from I don't know who the federal government, I suppose, if the, if, if all of these things happen. And so, uh, listen, I don't know if that's true or not, but if there are cash incentives for positive tested patients, you know, this is going to lead to hospitals testing every single patient that comes in the door, declaring them COVID positive, possibly even putting them on ventilators rather too readily, right? More readily than they otherwise would kind of thing. Um, and And this is why we get, you know, in hospital with COVID is not in hospital. It is not in hospital because of COVID, right? It's in hospital having tested positive for COVID. And and, and so the right. numbers as a consequence of these incentives, the, num the numbers that we've had from day one about cases, hospitalizations and deaths have been hugely, not entirely due to the incentives, but for some reason, someone somewhere made the decision that this is how we're going to define a case. This is how we're going to define a hospitalization. This is how we're going to define a death. And all of those definitions mean that we get way, way, way bigger numbers than is actually the case. Yeah, incentives are they're they're effective, or, or they yeah they have a, they have an effect. Um, that's not the doctor's and fault, just, right? That's the that's not the doctor's fault. The doctor has been instructed by their line manager test every patient that comes in the door for COVID, right? Now it's not the doctor's fault. The doctor's not. You know, doing anything wrong, they're just they're just following the protocols of the hospital. And you know, if if if, if a patient has trouble breathing, get them on a ventilator as soon as you can. That's the protocol issued by the hospital administrators, right? Who are very aware of the cash incentives. The doctor probably has no awareness of the cash incentives, right? They're just doing their job as best they can, doing what they're told, you know. So I I, I mm. think that I think that Zubin mischaracterized it a little bit as an attack on the doctors working in the hospital, where I don't think it was an attack on them at all. It was an attack on the incentive structures within which they are all working. Yeah, that's possible. That might have been a little bit of, um, you know, he, he focused in on the, the, the hospitalist aspect of it and, and maybe had a, a bit of an emotional um, reaction because, you know, he, he comes from that world and like, you know, we wouldn't... <laughs> He wouldn't be on it like that um but yeah he he definitely recognizes and talks about the fact that it's you know a medical industrial complex and the doctors working within it you know they're 
there's to some extent cogs in a machine. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, help people and the, why a lot of them got into the field. But um, once you're, you, you know, you're, you're employed by a, a hospital or a health system and, you know, there's um, edicts from administration. Um, and yeah, the, the incentives, it's like, I, it, it's, it's easy to see how people could see it as a, as this grand conspiracy um, based on the incentives. It's like, why would you, why would you, you know, be paying hospitals to do these things to people, right? Like through that lens, it looks like that, but you could also see it from the policy end. It's like, um, there's, there's sort of concern about the numbers of cases and sort of like, let's, let's throw resources at, at um, treating this thing, you know, treating people with this thing, but then it ends up in the medical industrial complex becoming this like perverse incentives that actually lead to overcounting um, and maybe over, you know, intubating people, you know, um, yeah, just some really unfortunate outcomes there, but, um, yeah, so I, I guess I'd have to watch the actual comment, um, to, to see how much I would agree that it was more about the system. He was yeah. pointing out systemic issues versus hospitalists, but either way, it seems like an effect, um, is that people go in and this came through in another interview that I don't know if you watched it, but um, that uh, Fuller did with uh, a hospitalist. I think he was working in Utah um, for a while. And he had the experience of people coming in, having listened to, some, you know, Malone, I think um, specifically, uh, at least in a couple of cases where they, they had translated or interpreted what he said as, you know, you doctors are in on it. Um, and so they, they came in with that. So, so how, how would Malone said it, it, it still kind of got interpreted that way, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not necessary. I, I, listen, I didn't hear what he said on that occasion, right? And But this is, this is kind of another point about sense making, isn't it? Like a really important one. Like however carefully you might craft what you are saying, you have no control over how people take it once it goes into, once it goes into their heads, right? And so mm -hmm. what... The way I heard it is through my lens, right, with my opinions about the person and the material and blah, blah, blah. And so I will no doubt hear it differently to someone who, you know, has different feelings about it. Anyway, back back to harm, if, if we may, because one of the biggest harms I think that has been done by the excesses of the thesis position is the undermining of public trust, right? Like there are there are huge swathes of the public now even those who are not necessarily on the vaccine resistant or anti-thesis anti side but who know perfectly well that what they're being told is bull is bullshit right and so this is a real real problem because people who know that they're being lied to about this or that have had information misrepresented to them say so, about this are now starting to question vaccination in general they were fine with vaccinations before right but now oh I mean, there's so much bullshit going on around this i wonder what else they're lying about right and so now people's distrust and curiosity has been peaked and i don't know where that leads to right because there's a lot of malfeasance gone on over the years in the pharmaceutical industry right and as people become more and more aware of that the degradation of trust in all pharmaceuticals in all medical treatments in the entire medical industrial establishment could be undermined in, in, in really millions and millions and millions and millions of people and that to me is an enormous harm and that is all on the thesis side that's not the anti-thesis side that's done that that's the thesis side that has created the market for the anti-thesis side through their bullshit mm. But it's a little bit of both, I think, right? There's um, like, so on the one hand, there have been um, real uh, advancements and um, benefits to population health from vaccines that have been um, created. So it's a mixed bag that, you know, there have been, you know, like the establishment has done some good work over the decades. Um, they've gotten, there's like corruption and perverse incentives that have led to, um, uh, you know, releasing things, I'm remembering like Vioxx, so you know, there's, there's an incentive to like, and also to, you know, take an existing medication, tweak it a little bit, market it as a new thing, you know, all these kind of shenanigans. Um, so it's like, it's, 
it's like, what's, what's the baby? What's the bathwater? What's the weed? What's the chow? Um, so both on the, on the existing. So, so like you're saying, there could be harm in people distrusting vaccines that are actually effective, you know, from, you know, measles, mumps, rubella, probably right. Um, polio, um, all those, all those things. Um, so yeah, harm could be and done. The based advice on the... of their doctor, right? They now because this doctor told advised me to take these vaccines. I know now that that advice was not based on. Do you know what I mean? Like it was not a fair assessment of the risk reward equation. Um, and so now I don't trust anything my doctor tells me in terms of. I mean, how harmful is that? Mm. Yeah, potentially very. Um, yeah, and then my mind goes to like you know how how can we um, reestablish trust in something? Um, you know, like, uh, it builds right. slowly and breaks immediately, right? It's a very, very delicate thing is trust. Yeah. 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 It's, I don't, it seems like we're sort of, we, we'll have to, we'll have to have some sort of like distributed, yeah, distributed systems, whether it's, whether it involves blockchain or not um because a lot of the issues come with centralization centralization of information centralization of authority um and yeah and so that's that's an issue even even within like um you know the scientific community and journalistic um, uh, um scientific journals articles like the, the common person can't access them there, there's a paywall um even it's been coming out more and more they even peer-reviewed articles uh, a lot of times they're you know they're selected for they're, there's incentives to promote certain ones versus other ones so there's there, there's all these flaws in the existing system and so much of it is related to centralization and yeah the when there's incentives to kind of like you know hide information or restrict it to, to benefit whether it's you know um an academic in their environment or um you know for a pharmaceutical company uh, try to make their products look as, as good as possible and, you know, scuttle some of the uh, negative results. So, you know, when it comes to like trust in, in um, doctors or trust in uh, healthcare institutions, um, my sense is that, yeah, it'll, we'll, we'll need to kind of make things less restricted, less centralized, uh, more distributed, and then have some way that people can trust where it's like there's more feelers out there sort of like with the throwing everything at, at a new problem at a new disease seeing what works and then you know the information getting sort of coalesced into you know okay this is what we found and you know and people trusting that um yeah yeah transparency i know exactly how to work but yeah 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 this is what's been lacking isn't it is that is at least the appearance of transparency, right? You know, the, what was her name? That girl that they had on Dark Horse that got the vaccine injury while she was participating in the children's trial, the Pfizer trial, right? And they dealt with it by removing her from the study, right? They 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 recorded it as a stomach ache and they removed her from the study, so she never had the second dose and didn't participate, and so she doesn't count in the in the numbers, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, this is uh, well, 100 participants in this study. I mean, I don't know if she was, the, I don't think she was the only injury, but even if she was one in 1200, that's, and it was a very serious injury, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's certainly reportable, but they maneuvered such that it never had to appear. And so when you see behavior like that, right, that, that, you know, when something does happen, rather than, oh my God, this is awful, let's, suspend until we investigate let's do everything we can to help this girl right the exact opposite of that right is like, like get her out of the study get her out of here let's yeah. not look at her let's pretend it that's a bad happen. data point let's get rid of that exactly one. Yeah. exactly <laughs> you know and and once you find out like even okay yeah it's it's one it's one thing right it's one person one thing but when you see like the attitude that underlies how it was dealt with right like that causes me serious misgivings about the whole thing right and I, I i get that i might be over extrapolating from one example I, I i do get that but like i said it's not that the thing happened to this girl and therefore we should worry about the vaccines it's that they 
handled it like that. Therefore, we should be very worried about anything that comes out of this institution. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I heard uh, someone recently saying that, and I think it's I think it's an attitude that a lot of people have, but it's it's a little bit unfortunate, well, very unfortunate. Like if if a if an actual if the next pandemic say is is legitimately you know ten times worse or whatever you know actually has some um, you know, pretty high death rates and, and it, you know affects younger people and everything, given the uh, the erosion of trust and the the, the mishandling of this this one, um, it's going to take like it'll take longer it'll it'll be more difficult to get people to, to believe um and and it, that'll yeah that'll end up in more harm um i guess the hope would be that and it's interesting too like i think uh, gates recently said something like um he basically saying you know the next pandemic will be coming soon uh and of course people who believe this was planned um are like what is what are they cooking up now because you know the last one came from the wuhan lab yeah. it seems like um are they you know is the next one going to be one that they've done research on or going to have uh vaccine ready for um if that's the case at least um i don't know i guess if they're if they're working on ones that are really dangerous really deadly uh just seems like a bad idea but um yeah either way um Whatever happens with the next pandemic, that, that erosion of trust, I think, will be a factor, unfortunately. Well, in, in the abstract, I can sort of see the sense of it, right? Like, if we are worried about pandemics, then studying the pathogens and looking at all the ways they can mutate and, you know, causing those mutations and then figuring out how to combat them. I mean, I, I do see some sense in it in the abstract, but given all of the perverse incentives and so on and so on that we've just been talking about, then yeah, it seems it does seem like folly. We're more likely to suffer a pandemic because of it leaking out of one of these institutions than from it happening naturally, kind of thing, right? Yeah, it all yeah. In my mind, it almost it starts to get into um, yeah, just like our our general approach to um, to like the relationship with the with the uh, biosphere. Um, you know, the fact that we're all, all the extraction, all the, you know, pollution uh, going further, like the fact that we're pressing further and further into places where these these viruses exist, you know, into the jungle where the bats are and everything. Um, they're just, I think, changing. It, there's like a fundamental sort of relational shift that, that can happen. I mean, it's, it'll be interesting to see if it does in our lifetimes, but that's, I think, what I'm hoping to contribute to um, is, you know, because I've, I've onboarded that as an understanding, like, that's what we need to do. Um, and then it's, yeah, through conversation, through, through maybe some group actions. Um, yeah, if enough people kind of gain the understanding, then, then it'll be possible to sort of collectively shift. But there's so there's so much inertia on you know um, the the approach that the current approach with with the extraction and the all of it that um, it'll be it doesn't look all that hopeful at the moment but no, um, it doesn't <laughs> yeah it's just but what, we, you, what you were just talking about with the with the redefining of the relationship with the with the biosphere um, you know pandemics is 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 a really good testing ground for that kind of reshaping of our thinking right because when people get sick and die from pathogens it's not actually the pathogen that's made them sick and killed them right it's their body's response to it um you know this is what elevates your temperature and causes increases in white blood cells and blah 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 it's it's, it's your body it's your body's attempt to fight it off that, that causes the actual symptoms and so if you have a harmonious relationship with the microorganisms that enter your body you don't get sick from them right and and part at least i'm not to, that's that's not to say that the healthiest most harmoniously living person in the world doesn't get sick from time to time that's, that's not what i'm trying to say but what what i am trying to say is that if we have this if we have a harmonious relationship with the microorganisms that exist around us rather than this 
scrub every surface, disinfect every dish. You know what I mean? Mm. Like this kind of thing. Mm. Like keep it all away from me. Um, I, I think I think at least in part our susceptibility to pandemics is this deep sickness we have in that these things are to be kept out rather than had a relationship with. Yeah. Yeah. Even um, uh, in a recent, what was it? Um, I forget exactly where it was, but basically um, this is something about sort of like Western uh, with like monotheism and there, there's this, yeah, it's sort of like separating God and nature versus seeing God, like God as nature, like basically God's using everything. But with this, with this distinction and, um, you know, nature is sort of like chaos or something to be dominated, something to be um, conquered. Um, it's a different, it's a different relationship. Well, and also um, God inserts man into nature, right? God creates the world and then God creates yeah, man and puts him right, in the also world rather us, than man was born from the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Right. Right. Yeah. Like we we actually, um, spread, you know, evolved uh, with with the biosphere. So we're part of it. Um, and then that, that separation thing is, is, is where it becomes possible to that separation mentality. Yeah, basically can and has led to uh, these, these issues. So, yeah, I mean, just on the pathogen thing, so the, like the more general perspective is the relationship with nature and the biosphere but then with pathogens specifically it's like um i wouldn't say harmonious necessarily but it's like in an ecosystem there's 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 checks and balances opponent processing right and a sort of um equilibrium gets established and that's that sort of harmony but at the same time you know there's lots of like uh battles and you know deaths and things right but it's but it's it's opponent processing just figuring out like kind of how all this thing can work um, in a way that the whole thing gets to, you know, move forward through time. Um, and when we, when we change our context too quickly, like, um, you know, the Europeans bringing over diseases and, and wiping out a lot of the native populations. Um, so that was a change, you know, like a, it wasn't really the natives fault. They, and it, you know, the Europeans didn't do it intentionally, at least not initially. Um, but in general, like what what seems to work is like there, there's a not not to make too drastic a change with the relationship or the yeah the context um, because the fact the reason that the Ukraine were um, immune to those diseases or at least largely immune was that they'd experienced them it had been part of their history and so yeah like a quick change or like when we invade. Um, jungles or whatever, and start encountering um, pathogens that we haven't, you know, over hundreds of years or whatever. Mm. It's that's where it's easy for something to um, end up harming a lot of people. So yeah, it's yeah, not again, that easy for them to get into humans, right? I mean, I suppose unless we encounter a human mm. population which carries a disease to which they're all immune, but we're not, then I suppose that that that's an easy enough jump. But also, there's the permafrost, right? There's like ancient viruses frozen in the permafrost does that matter that's, right. that's another possibility right. for sort of the pandemic so yeah i anyway should we should we move on to another harm i mean i think we've, we've basically agreed in the trust thing haven't we like that's a giant harm going forward right the 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 yeah the undermining of trust in public health authorities in doctors in hospitals in pharmaceutical companies you know the whole giant thing in governments yep. as well, in media, right? Like, uh, where are people supposed to, like that, that sense that, yeah, sure, they do stupid things from time to time, but basically we can we can trust the institutions. Eric Weinstein, I think, made a really good point in his interview, right? That there is, yes, the institutions are decayed and corrupt and, you know, populated by weak, selfish, avaricial people, but, there is also a lot of residual wisdom in these institutions. They were created for a reason, right? They were created for good reasons, who people by people who were smart and cared and, and understood the reasons for creating them. In time, those reasons have sort of been forgotten, but nevertheless, embedded in those institutions is still 
a lot of useful wisdom. And I think that's a really, really, really important. It goes back to the baby and bathwater thing, right? It's a really important point. Mm -hmm. Right. Can we can we keep can we keep what's good about the existing institutions and instill like reinstill trust? Um, maybe it's I just just like with the nature thing i think it's a it's a it's a chain it's a shift in sort of the the mode of operating um which it would just yeah it would take like a critical mass of people um doing that and then because i think if if you actually have represented you know if people are actually speaking in ways not not seeming overly certain are overly relying on their authority to, you know, just tell us what, um, yeah, like what we should do just based on authority, but with like humility, um, I mean, the, again, the Japanese um, approach where they're, they're sharing information with the public, letting them make their own decisions, basically treating people like adults. Um, if that, you know, if that's the more than the operating mode, then I think, you know, it, could be possible to continue using like the infrastructure and, and the like institutional knowledge that's that's good maybe in, in a lot of these organizations. But um yeah, under under current incentives it's it just led to what well, we've been seeing. So I feel like it's a it's 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 a problem which exists primarily at the top layer, right? I mean I, I get the sense that the overwhelming majority of people who work in these institutions are perfectly decent ordinary folk you know what i mean just doing their jobs as best they can kind of thing right and yeah sure some of them are lazy some of the time and so what but whatever you know like broadly speaking and that it's the it's the incentive structures but it, but, but who creates those incentive structures right and and you know and and so it's really a crisis of leadership a failure to recognize that the institutions are no longer serving the function that they were designed to serve and yet happy to let them continue running like that right it, re it really is a crisis of leadership you can't expect the frontline doctor who's actually treating patients to you know also be making policy decisions do you know what i mean like they they they, they should have yeah. some feedback into the process but they, they can't be and and yet the people who are making those decisions that affect everyone's working are not actually treating patients you know what i mean like they're far 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 removed from the realities of actually treating patients so it's like you were saying before like there's, there's, there's some somehow or other this disconnect which exists between the top layer of management and everything that exists underneath it because everything that exists underneath it that's the decentralized web of just people doing their thing and talking to who they need to talk to in order to communicate the thing that needs to be communicated right and actually very little of it depends on directives coming down from on high i mean i know i've worked in institutions and when directives come down from, oh, for fuck's sake you know what i mean people just people are just doing what they do and the whole thing kind of runs on its own really you don't actually need anyone to run it per se not to say that there shouldn't be someone around there gathering the large vision but but you know basically it runs itself so yeah that that decentralized distributed um structure that you were talking it's kind of already there right you just have to somehow or other convince the people at the top that they are no longer required or that their roles need to dramatically change they're not there to issue directives for the whole thing they're there to yeah, yeah. there's also um there's there's been a trend toward uh you know more and more this, this is in like academia and healthcare um and probably other areas where a trend toward um administration like more and more bullshit jobs that um that make a lot of money uh off the backs of you know off the actual work of um those in the, in the system whether it's teachers you know professors uh or doctors and nurses in the healthcare system um so yeah it it's the same time to it it really is like everyone it's it's kind of easy to point to and say you know leadership should change their uh, their approach or you know basically like the elites should like they have the most resources so they're the ones who should drive the change. Um, you know maybe there's Not something to that. But, saying, but yeah, you know, but, but go on. Sorry, make your point. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's just my my sense is that people, you know, they they get trained up through 
um, you know, universities through um, when they end up in these leadership positions, their their understanding of things and the way that they run things is based on their experiences and how you know um, it's not. Yeah, it's not like they have, um, you know, malevolent or, or or they want the negative things to be happening in the system based on their decisions. It's just sort of an out of touchness. Um, it's uh, so it's like to change to change the system. It's like at least when, you know when I talk about and think about these things, it's it generally comes back to you know what what do we want and how can we. Um, in our lives, like try to help make that reality because yeah, just give, given, you know, like we're all, we're all creating the system, right? We're all part of it. And if we don't like the results. Like we, we need to do what we can to help make it different. I want to trust Fauci. I do. I want to, I want to be able to trust the guy that's in that job. Yeah. You know yeah. I, I absolutely do. It's not, it's not some kind of a game, right? Like looking for ways to, aha, there we go. He's contradicted himself. Cool. You know, it's, it, it really isn't like that. But, and, 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 and one can forgive a certain amount, right? But I, again, Eric Weinstein made this point. Like, where are the people, you know, where's the Neville Chamberlain who steps down for the good of the country? I realize I am not the man for this job, right? We need somebody else here right now. You know, I am only going to fuck things up. So let me get out of the way and make room for somebody who's going to do a better job. Why is Fauci not doing like, uh, you know, for better or worse, whatever the truths and falsehoods, but people don't trust me anymore. And I am not fit to be the face of this. So I'm going to make room for somebody else who is better, who's, who's better suited. You know what I mean? Like, where is that kind? Of, I don't mean him specifically, but anyone, where is this kind of attitude? Um, well, I think this is. And Fauci is probably a decent example. Um, he's kind of in his his bubble, and um, like, yeah, some people don't trust him. But there's analogs with the um, the the Canadian trucker thing and, and sort of Trudeau's approach. Yeah. It's like believing that you know, I have I have the right answer. The, I mean, the hubris thing. Like Fauci's saying, basically, I represent science. You know, I am science. Um, He's kind of drunk, drunk the Kool Aid on, <laughs> on himself. Um, so yeah, the the humility to to see where he's maybe gone wrong and then step down. It's just not even a, a consideration. You know, he's built up his career and his reputation, and some people see him as almost like this godlike uh, figure um, still, um, even with all the all the mistakes. So yeah, but to to get back or to to have a situation where leaders would have that kind of humility to step down you know and, and really care about the greater good of the whole that's that's another kind of like mode of operating shift that would have to happen um i guess I mean, it, it, it almost seems it's a measure of how very poor our leadership and our culture generally like how little we expect of leadership right is that it, it almost seems like a fantastical idea someone stepping down acknowledging that they are just you know i'm out of my depth here or people don't trust me anymore or that was a do you know what i mean like unless they're <laughs> pressure mounts on twitter <laughs> yeah to it has to be <laughs> there's no no just doing it with honor yeah yeah those are not the times we're living in um but yeah we we can point to you know not not all that long ago in history so it's it we know it's possible just a question of kind of how to how to re reinstill that and uh yeah sort of enough of enough of the population yeah may or may not happen we're but well, like i said I mean, it's you know, there in the population but, but I, I i mean i i think a lot of the people that have those kinds of qualities are so turned off by the whole idea of getting into public office right because they see what it is right and what it took what it demands of people what it turns people into and the kind of people that seem to ascend the ranks and they go you know what fuck that that's not for me yep yeah there's a well not to get too far afield i guess and also just um Fine. i'll have a meeting yeah yeah a meeting at the hour but um just a thought for me that, that 
comes up around leadership and the kind of leadership that that we have versus leadership that would be um, more um, I don't know more constructive, more more based on the good of the whole. Uh, there's there are models from history. One in the um, the dawn of everything, which I'm still working my way through, but uh, there's one example where basically in that culture, if people wanted to become leaders, it wasn't about um, you know um, presenting yourself as uh, great and wise and, and that kind of thing. It was it was really more about like uh, self deprecation. You you had to go through a process of like you know recounting your flaws um, and the 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 group, the population would basically, I don't know exactly what the practice was, but they um, they had to basically endure kind of like these struggle sessions where people would tell them what's wrong with them and kind of thing. So before they could ascend to a leadership position, they had to go through this, this difficult kind of self-effacing thing. So the people that ended up there, um, it's just a very different, you know, type of person and a very different type of leadership that would, that would happen there. So, yeah, it's you know, the exact opposite of the, the leadership contests are based on glorification of the leader right aren't they aren't they wise as opposed to, that's the exact opposite right it's based on the ability to withstand denigration say something like that mm. yeah i mean there's there's some you know people people try to uh reference to their you know like i grew up in a like they try to be relatable i grew up on a farm and you know or i <laughs> like they try to play up whatever sort of like working class or those kind of credentials if they can but um, a lot of it's kind of performative. Uh, it's not most most of the politicians and things have you know gone through the the universities and the you know the sort of elite institutions. So they're kind of they're, there's a bit of out of touchness that just tends to, to to be there. Yeah, I don't know if I don't know if you can trace it back to roughly the same, but it was it was sometime in the mid '80s, I would say, something like that, when there was a really noticeable and quite sudden change in the type of person who was a politician, right? Like prior to the Trump, prior to the mid seventies, say, politicians were, or the senior politicians were for the most part, people who had done stuff in their lives, right? You know, they had, they had been in business or in the arts or in education or whatever, and had risen to some sort of, and then in their forties, fifties, they entered politics and, you know, in their sixties, whatever, they were senior members of, they were senior members of the cabinet. And it really was thing. public service, you know, um, more the attitude than, than now it's like, yeah, how can I get ahead and how can I leverage being a politician into uh, making money afterwards, being, you know, a lobbyist or giving speeches. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole, it's become a whole. And you're right, it was around like 70s, 80s, there was a shift, I think. You can look at um, things that were happening like with unions and things like in New York. And the kind of people who were politicians, they, it was like working class, like you were saying. Um, but yeah, somehow over the years, it really shifted. And also journalists. Journalists used to be much more working class. Now they're all pretty much, you know, um, coming through elite institutions. Yeah, I mean, even the working class, so-called working class parties, right? The Democrats and the Labour Party. It's all middle class university graduates, you know, who haven't really mm -hmm. done anything. They're not union leaders. They're not industrialists. They're not, you know plumbers that have created a successful business and gone they're, they're, they're none of those things they're career politicians who go to oxford and cambridge and do their politics philosophy and economics degrees and then go on and start working as a party activist get involved in local politics blah, 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 blah. do you know what i mean like never actually do anything in the real world it's a completely different breed of individual and i think it's so it's so they lose so much by not having that grounding in having accomplished something with your life, right? Actually being, at least to some degree, expert, accomplished at something or other, right? And B, by having all of those people who have various different accomplishments coming together, you've got a huge range of perspectives at play, right? When debates and, and arguments and policy making committees and whatever are happening, you've got genuine differences of perspective yeah, whereas now they're all the fucking same they've all come through the same educational track right yeah the much more um apt or uh likely to sort of like group think or even you know, like they don't think that they're doing group think because there's all different flavors of it but it's like you know it's all within this you know and then it's like a uh, republican democrat you know little differences but there's a lot of like the same assumptions or understandings or uh like investment in the existing systems and how they how they work even yeah in the co-op co 
shouldn't have happened. Like watching um, people like uh, you know AOC and American politics. She's she's seen as sort of like the sort of ultra progressive. Um, but once she's in the system, it's like her actual you know challenging the, the existing like Democratic Party. She kind of she's gotten kind of just like she'll do these little performative things, but like really materially, yeah. she doesn't really have any power and it's so just the system ends up you know kind of like twisting people into <laughs> kind of going along with it yeah you have no voice outside of the democratic party and if you want to have a voice in the democratic party you've got to follow the rules and so you're you're, you're caught right there's, there's nothing you can do yeah yeah or you're frozen out and then you can't really do anything so it's like you kind of get corrupted and try to change a little bit within the system or do you yeah that's it and that's why i reckon most most idealistic young folk that's exactly what i think they settle for is I'll, I'll change what little thing i can change you know I'll, I'll play along and change what little things i can change along the way i think is exactly what most of them settle for rather than out in the cold shame well um <laughs> yeah started with harm uh kind of got a little more um I love yeah, I've actually got more on harm, but it's kind of variations. And, and the biggest one, I think, is the, is, the, is the destruction of trust. I mean, I think the consequences of that are going to be felt for years and years and years to come. And I mean, the other one is what's been done to children, both masks and vaccines. You know what I mean? Like forcing forcing this onto children, especially young children, you know, as young as five walking around school with masks on all day long. You know, the, 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 the psychological, emotional, social consequences of this. I think this is a giant harm, which we haven't even begun to notice the effects of yet. Yeah, as those kids grow up too, like um, yeah. they're, it, yeah, it goes along with the, you know, sort of harmonious relationship with, with you know, nature, the world um, versus, and, and some of that's like, you know, um, the possibility of, of harm, like a uh, rough play, you know, exploring, um, like and yeah if it's just this constant attitude of like safety 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 you know keep everything at bay like that safetyism attitude um as they grow up i don't know yeah um won't be very uh, adaptive well, but right. the at the same time there's... caused by falling off the tree and breaking your arm is that bigger than the harm caused by never being allowed to climb trees i mean uh... right yeah So, well, <laughs> not the most cheery um, uh, place to end, but um, yeah, explored some good territory. Yeah, and I guess, we strayed uh, a little bit, but yeah, it was a really interesting conversation. Really interesting. All right. Yeah. Good to see you, Josh. Same. All right. I'll probably see you at the Liminal Dow. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. All right. See, see you later. later.